Hey everybody, thanks for being here today. We're just uh, watching some of the attendees join, so just give us a minute and we'll get started. It's funny comparing what we're doing to how the celebrities have been doing the Instagram live, you know, freestyle <laughs> battles, if I'm waiting for, you know, T-Pain or <laughs> Donnie yeah. Wahlberg to show up in the attendees. That would be great, actually. I'd love that. Looks like we still have some people joining. And while you're doing that, I just sent a note. Um, if you have the ability to change your view to gallery view, please do. And if you have the ability in your view options to do side-by-side -side mode, uh, we found that to be the best usage of, of seeing the screen. Perfect. All right, Rob, looks like there's still some people joining, but what do you, what do you say? Why don't we get started? All right, let's do it. All right. Um, well, let's start by good morning, good afternoon, good evening, pre-sales community. Uh, welcome to the second installment of the pre-sale collective webinar. I'm James Kekis, currently a solutions engineer leader at Salesforce, and I'm honored to be your host today. Uh, for those that are joining for the first time, hello and thank you. For those that are tuning in for the second week in a row, it's nice to see you again and thank you for your support. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and your commitment to growing our community. Uh, since we've launched this about three weeks ago, we've been really excited um, to see all the interaction, um, all of the participation. And you know, I think what we're most proud of is, is being a global community. Uh, last week, we had representation from 12 countries on the webinar, uh, so that was very exciting. It's a very great step in the right direction for our profession, for our collective effort. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go through a quick agenda, set some expectations, and then we'll get into it. So I want to say first is, you know, welcome and thank you for those for the first time. For those that are here for the second week in a row, just want to lightly talk about the pre-sale collective mission and why we're here. We'll spend a majority of our time with Rob, Rob Falcone, and highlight, um, and also highlight what's coming. So for those who don't know, we have a fantastic webinar schedule, a great session last week with Chris White, another great session with Rob here today, and we have eight weeks in a row of webinars. We'll talk about that at the end. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention is that we really want to make these interactive. Um, you know, you came here to hear Rob's perspective, but ask questions. So please use the Q&A section of Zoom. If you have feedback for us as panelists, use the chat function. And we'll do a couple of Zoom polls throughout the session. Um, again, if you haven't heard so, make sure you're using gallery view. And if you have the option to do side by side, please do so for the best viewing experience. So briefly, I wanna, <clears throat> excuse me, highlight our mission, right? Our, our mission is on our website. It's our about, our vision, uh, but we are relentlessly focused on growing and developing pre-sales professions around the world. The collective has been you know, will be a source of inspiration, resources, knowledge, best practice sharing. And what I wanna stress is it's gonna be everything you want it to be. This is a collective for our profession, for our group. And I will continue to drive the message that with the expansion of technology, pre-sales roles are more vital than ever. Customer life cycle, sales life cycle. Um, so I'm really, really excited to see what we do as a community together. Before we get started, I um, want to start with a quick Zoom poll, so I'm going to get that started. Uh, we want to know what best describes your role. Are you an SCSC? Are you a, a leader? Are you an AE? Um, interested in becoming an SC? So while that's going, I'd like to uh, finally introduce Rob Falcone to the webinar. So for those who don't know, Rob is the Senior Director of Sales Engineering and Strategy at Guru. Um, I'm actually personally really jealous of his title and his role, uh, but he not only leads the sales engineering function, but he's on the bleeding and leading edge 
of strategies and, and things we'll talk about today, product-led growth and product-led sales. Uh, what's unique about Rob is not only has he been in pre-sales for quite some time, he actually was a VP of sales at Zoomer. Uh, he led a 30-person company there and has, again, been an SC, enterprise, enterprise sales rep. He's all over. And um, I don't know about you, but I most know Rob from his book, Just Effing Demo, uh, which was an intentionally short guide to leading product demos. It peaked at number one on Amazon for sales presentation bestseller. If anyone has ever worked for me that's on this, they know that I literally bring up Rob's article and book every three months. And so Rob, thanks for being here. Glad to have you. Yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me and excited to, to dive in. Me too. Um, you know, personally, I, I've really, in, I've been a fan of Rob for years. And uh, one of the best things about this pre-sales collective process is getting to know people in the industry and getting to know Rob and working with them has been fantastic. Um, I've learned that we're both baseball fans and we're both from a great state of Pennsylvania. I just happen to be from the better side in Pittsburgh uh, versus Philly. Um, but uh, without further ado, Rob, I want to uh, send the floor to you and I will share the results of our of our attendees, it looks like we have 63% SCFCs, 22% um, SCSC leaders. Shout out to the account executive and sales leaders here today. 6% um, of people looking to become an SC and 4% others. So thank you for filling it out. Helps us cater our message and make sure we cover everything we need to today. All right, let's do it. So. High level, what we're going to talk about today is the shift in buyer behavior that a lot of us are seeing in B2B sales and how those of us on this call can, can really use that and, and take advantage of it to help make our teams better. So first thing we'll talk about is product-led growth is the, the kind of cool buzzword in the tech community right now. So a lot of folks still don't even know what it is, what it means. What it means is it's the acquisition model where the product serves as the primary driver driver for user acquisition activation and retention right so you think of the company where you start using the product it's free or there's a trial you share it with somebody else they start using it, and all of a sudden half the people on your team are using this free product and it begins to grow from there so everything is done in terms of onboarding using and expanding everything is done via the product itself Right. So think about that highly experiential uh, go to market, go to market motion as product led growth. On the flip side, though, you still have teams where the product is at the absolute core of what they do, but they're still relying on humans to bring the product to market. Right. So you have this buyer to human interaction as opposed to the buyer to product interaction. Now, what's cool and what I think is super exciting and where we'll spend a lot of time talking today is more and more companies are going from left to the middle or from right to the middle and meeting here in this hybrid product-led growth, product-led sales motion where you have this combination of customer, product, and sales team. So why are more and more companies doing this? Why are they shifting from product-led growth to that hybrid? Why are they shifting from product-led sales to that hybrid? Well, they're doing it because it works and because when done well, it can be really, really powerful, right? So when you take a look at some of the companies that are doing this quite effectively, they're becoming household names in tech. And, and, and why have they gone this route of experiential plus sales-led? It's because the customer has dictated it, right? When I think about what B2B buyers are doing in their personal lives, everything is now on demand. When I got locked in the house in COVID and I had my, my, my hankering for baseball and I couldn't get it on TV, I pushed one button and I was able to download a game for PlayStation in five minutes versus going down the street to GameStop, right? So those same people that have this very instant, very tangible, uh, very experiential buying cycle in their personal lives, when they clock in on Monday, they expect to be able to get their hands on the product. And so this is really where this idea of human led plus, plus experiential and product led is coming together. It's being driven by the customer, but it's still really, really difficult and teams have to adjust. Yeah, thanks Rob. And I'm gonna go ahead and start a quick poll. 
So we want to ask, which of the options best describes your company? And if you're still a little concerned, um, just it, it's not a perfect science, self-service, sales-led, and hybrid. And Rob, I know when we initially started talking about this, I was really excited, right? Because I think what we want to make sure we get out of today is some of our, co our companies or customers are already kind of moving to this model, but there might be a time in the next six, nine, 12 months, especially when we come out of this current situation where companies that are traditionally sales led only are going to make this shift. And I think what we want people to realize, you know, again, down the road is say, wow, like I heard that from Rob on, on, on the webinar series very early. And we think this is a shift because customer expectations are absolutely changing. So definitely interested to see where most people are at. All right, let's see it. All right. We are at 58% sales led only, 41% is a hybrid and one person is a self-service. Awesome, that's super helpful. And I'll be able to, as we go, kind of tailor the talk track to, to those two, uh, those two uh, predominant respondents there. Okay, so at Guru, we polled our sales users uh, a few months ago and we asked what were the most difficult challenges their teams were facing in terms of hitting their revenue goals. And so these were the top five. And when you drill in a little bit further, you notice that these three right here are super consistent and these are what really then start to present the opportunities for growth for pre-sales teams. So it's Companies that are having difficulty answering customer questions quickly and accurately, they're dealing with frequent product changes and dealing with remote or rapidly scaling teams as downward, uh, as, as headwinds to achieving their revenue goals, right? So these are the challenges that they're facing. And they really do point back to the specific attributes of these companies that, you know, we're calling product-led sales organizations. So as I go through some of the, the, the three most important attributes here are the most common attributes. Think about how your organization aligns with these specific attributes and the challenges they present. So the first attribute I look at when I'm talking about a company being a, a product-led sales company is their product. It's inherently disruptive, it's technologically complex, it's expansive across a number of different business units, it's rapidly evolving. Selling this type of a product is difficult in and of itself. Right? But it becomes even more difficult when you consider the knock-on effect of the next two pieces here. So second being the customer interaction. These are typically customers that are super well-informed and often technical in nature. And when you add in the potential that these customers have an experiential component, now that makes it even more challenging for sellers to sell this product because it's totally unpredictable when this customer can raise their hand and need your help or want to engage with you. So you have the product, you have the customer, and then lastly, you have the organization. So a lot of these organizations that we're calling product by sales are hiring in geographically disparate locations so that they can maximize their talent pool, or in the case of right now, everybody's selling remotely anyway, right? So the fact that they're bringing in a difficult product to market with a difficult customer and these geographically disparate teams just makes this really, really challenging. And so what we'll talk about more is how Many sales organizations have one of these three attributes and challenges, but it's really the combination of two and three of them that set up the opportunity for your teams to, to step into the spotlight. And so on that point, quick story, some of you may know this, um, 97 NBA Finals, last game of the series, games tied up, and everybody knows that the Bulls have these two Hall of Famers on the left-hand side here, and one of them is going to get the ball to take the game-winning shot including the Jazz, right, the, the opposing team. And so when the ball goes to Michael Jordan, what does he do? He kicks it out to Steve Kerr, his secret weapon off the bench, who steps up, hits the game-winning shot, and the Bulls win the 97 NBA Finals over the Jazz. So what does that tell us? That tells us that the situation dictated that they need to do something different, and the secret weapon was ready to step up into the spotlight. This is very much the same thing that product-led sales teams are facing. The situation is changing how we need to sell. And within most of these companies, all of yours, if you're here today, you have these super versatile, super skilled folks who with some tweaks in how they're acting on a day-to-day -day basis and how they're participating in sales motions really can become the secret weapons. So I'm gonna talk through three of those different ways and how they align with 
three pretty common skill sets that we see in pre-sales professionals. Okay. So the first of the three ways is going to tap into pre-sales folks' demo expertise and their ability to train people on becoming demo experts. One of the things that's interesting with all this is that customers are really dictating that the top of the funnel process has to change. You know, no longer is it the sellers going through a discovery call 30 minutes and the seller is asking all the questions to learn the information. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The customers are now interrogating the sellers. And as I mentioned earlier, the data is showing that sellers are becoming even more and more frightened at answering tough customer questions because of the product changing and the organization being so geographically disparate, right? So you have this really scary dynamic at the top of the funnel where not only is it difficult to have this conversation in a traditional sense, but then you also have customers who just aren't tolerant to have a discovery process because they know they can just go to the website and try it themselves. And so their tolerance for a straight discovery process is waning. So what does that mean for pre-sales folks? The opportunity here for pre-sales folks is that teams are gonna have to get comfortable showing the product earlier in the process, as early as the first call. Now, obviously, unless you're at a one-to-one -one ratio and have a really big pre-sales team, obviously, that's typically not the case and pre-sales can't be on every single call. So the idea here is how can pre-sales empower their teams to show the product earlier in the process as early as the first conversation? There's three easy ways that we've been working with. One is putting together a discovery demo flow. And what I mean is 30 minutes where you have some portion of straight discovery, some portion of demo, some combination of the two, and then outlining what next steps could look like. So pre-sales can put together that 30 minute flow. Another way is putting together a demo script for individual features. What are the core features within the product, the most differentiated features within the product, and how do you, AE, demoing this on a first conversation, show that and show that effectively? And so a third is demo video. And this is something that I've been experimenting with more and more. There's a lot of great free solutions out there. Loom, for example, is one. So how do you either on the left-hand side here empower an AE to create an offline demo video that they're either using before or after a first conversation? Or do the pre-sales team, does the pre-sales team create these videos themselves and have a repository of videos for the top five, 10 features that AEs can use at their disposal? So again, the idea here is at scale, you want to be able to empower your team to show the product and show the product early and often. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff, Rob. And uh, we've got a couple of questions before we do that. I want to launch a quick poll. So ask people, you know, what tactics would you be most likely to try within your organization? So just launch the poll. Please give us your thoughts on that. Um, I've gotten a couple of questions so far. Um, and one of them, I guess, putting in my own words is, you talked about three factors that, you know, of product led organizations, product, customer and organization. Um, and we got some questions around sales teams. And so like, how does though, how do those three factors make it more difficult for a sales team to do a disco demo? Yeah. So think about those three, three factors um, and what could be challenging in a discovery conversation irregardless of demo, right? You have a product that's super disruptive. So the customer is going to be asking questions because they've never seen something like this before. And the, 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 the questions are going to be challenging for that reason, right? You have a product that has trial or self-service options and maybe the customer is not going to engage in a traditional discovery conversation. You have a product that's rapidly changing and an organization that's geographically distributed. So it's difficult to, to maintain mastery of the product for a discovery conversation, right? So all of those three things make a discovery conversation challenging. Then when you layer demo on top of that, it's like the perfect storm for most AEs, right? So really it's about, again, what can the, the pre-sales team do to overcome those challenges and make the AEs more effective when they're doing something that's already super difficult. And so I found that those three things, uh, prepping them up with framework for a good discovery demo conversation, 
prepping them up to actually show at least one feature on that first conversation and then supplementing them with videos can be three ways to overcome those challenges top of the funnel. No, that's good. Let me, let me ask you one quick thing. So I've just shared our results and it looks like we got a pretty close split with pre-recorded short demos for key features and then arming the AEs with, with clear disco demo meeting structure, right? You know, they both play a factor. Got a couple of questions. I just want to ask your quick opinion. I know we're going to save a lot of our Q&A for the end, but I think this is very timely. So do you find that videos are hard to maintain in a fast changing product? 100%. Yeah. I mean, again, think about the types of companies that we're talking about here. These are fast growing tech companies. They're not probably not legacy companies still selling things from 10 years ago. Right. So that makes it super difficult. And so the question I think then becomes with respect to video is, can you distribute this so that maybe it's not one person doing all of the videos? Maybe you have one subject matter expert per topic or per feature and they're responsible for just maintaining up-to-date videos for that feature. Maybe you have intelligence of some sort that says, hey, this is when it's time to update it, or this is super popular. Can we create variants of it? Um, and then the third thing with respect to video is people have often thought of video as this like very high production value, marketing driven, super beautiful. But in reality, when we're talking about demo videos, it could literally be hop on a loom video, record the I mean, I'm stuttering as I speak right now because it's how we talk when we're in normal settings. Record a demo video like that. And as, as long as it would take you to show the feature, that's how long it takes you to, to record the video. So it doesn't have to be super high production value to maintain. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. And that, we've got a lot of questions around this. So keep the questions coming. I'm adding them into uh, our Q&A session at the end. Thanks, Rob. Awesome. All right. So the second one here, taps into if the first, uh, the first of the three tips was about pre-sales demo expertise, the second one's gonna tap into pre-sales and their ability to be effective and flexible in client-facing scenarios. And so when I first started thinking about product-like growth, I thought either, you know, at first I was like, that's scary because I'm in sales. And then when I started to digest it, I was like, well, you know, that's top of the funnel stuff. But as I mentioned earlier and kind of alluded to earlier, this idea of experiential really is here to stay because it, again, is driven by people and their B2C buying habits. People want to be able to touch and feel and experience and de-risk, and they want to be able to do that at the top of the funnel just as much as they do when they're engaged in the sales process, right? That same person who would let you spoon feed them the product through two and three and four demos years ago, they're not going to do that anymore. Uh, they might give you one and then it's like, okay, let's get into it. Uh, and that's really counterintuitive for a lot of us that have been in sales for, for years. So what is the effective way to don't just effing demo over and over and over and instead add in this experiential component? So I say augment demos with experiential. And it's really important when you start to think about this to think about the totality of your sales process. How do you integrate experiential into it versus like drastically knee jerk shifting away from demos? And so it's really important because again, you're, you're probably not going to just straight replace demos with trials or POCs, right? Because a trial or a POC really does require some effort on behalf of the customer to be a success. So what we've seen and what we've been doing is thinking about, as you see on the left hand side here, our entire sales process, mapping that to the buying process and what they're trying to do, and then layering in on top of the demo, this, you know, a, what I'm calling a guided trial. And so what happens then is instead of two, three, and four demos being the mechanism for getting that technical win, I might be going one demo. And the goal of that demo is to get someone to feel comfortable enough that this is a viable solution so that they can put effort against a guided trial. And then through an experience in the guided trial, they're going to experience and prove to themselves that there is a technical fit here and that this is ultimately the right solution. So that's the big takeaway here is when you're thinking about adding in experiential to your sales process, you have to think about it as kind of like a yes and as opposed to a either or when you think about it in respect to traditional demos. And so 
when you think about then, okay, you've got this product led growth component. We want to integrate it into the sales funnel itself. Like what value am I adding on top of what they can do themselves? And so this is where I have, you know, again, guided trials in quotes. These are some of the different things that pre-sales folks can do in their client interaction in terms of helping their customers through these guided trials in a way that's going to make the customer successful and in a way that also offers a value add on top of what the customer could just do themselves. So some of these things in particular, scoping and planning, you know, it might not be the best way to experience the product by rolling it out to everyone for 30 days. Um, so how can you help them figure out what they're trying to accomplish and scope out the people and systems that are going to be a part of the, the POC or the guided trial user training is an easy one. And what's interesting here is that, we talk about the uh, fundamentals of a good demo and how they should be short and compact and value oriented. User training is often the opposite. You're really gonna get into the weeds and show how someone can push the button and use this during their trial or POC. Mid trial insights. How can you take a look and parse through the data and the dashboards that they're probably not super familiar with yet and tell them something that's a value add that they didn't already know. And quite frankly, could be valuable whether or not they choose your solution, right? So how are you adding insight on top of what they're doing in terms of getting comfortable with the product? And then lastly, on the, the post-trial side, this is where, you know, really diving into, here's how you used it, here's how we can course correct, here's where you saw value, and here's how we now build a business case on top of that. Really de-risking what is adoption going to look like and how is that adoption going to re lead to downstream strategic success. Yeah. And we got a lot of questions here. And so I, I, you know, I'm excited to talk about this one because one, I have some experience in this too. And two, by the way, I, I can't ahead. see the questions. So every time you say that, I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God, people are like, this guy fucking sucks. Get him out. <laughs> Hopefully they're good questions. Um, but carry on. What, what am Just I going to into my okay. head? What am I going to ask? So as we said, we want to make sure these are interactive. Um, one of the things when I saw your slide deck the first time that I've been waiting to ask you is you literally put just don't effing demo, right? Which is literally the title of your book with a big red don't in front of it. So tell me, I just tell me about that. Why, why, what's the approach? Yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> I can't stress it enough. Um, when I wrote the book in 2014, it was like, there were things that we would do in demos that were very deliberate and intentional. You know, don't go too deep into the product in the first conversation, give them a reason to come back and talk to you the second time. And then the second time, don't answer all their questions on the second demo, uh, hold some so that you have a reason to go back and have a third demo. And, and it's just not the same anymore. It, it really isn't. And so, um, that's why maybe it's just so that I can keep selling more books. I haven't written off demos entirely, <laughs> but I think it really does go to that. Um, a demo still has a ton of value in convincing someone that there is, there's something here and I'm going to now put in the additional work to make sure and de-risk for myself um, that there is a technical and a tactical win here. So um, just don't, F I should have said like, just don't F in demo five times. Um, demo once, demo twice was ever appropriate, but then see how you can then augment that with, um, with experiential and do so in a way that you're very clear. What am I trying to achieve with the demo? And it could be, again, getting the thumbs up to put effort against the trial. And then what are we trying to achieve with the trial? And it's the thumbs up that this is the right solution for us. Yeah. No, that's great. And I, I want to spend some time here because we actually have questions flooding in and a comment that said, please let Rob know. I don't think he effing sucks. So you have some good, good allies on your side. Um, one of the things that is so top of mind to me here is that as organizations, we feel that we have this sales process. And I've got a couple of questions. It's like, uh, do you think guided trials should be paid engagements? And what I feel is like, those are our sales processes. But what about the buying process? And in previous roles, you know, I, I was pretty a, much a stickler around not doing a POC due to how much it would actually take us, like effort-wise. But at the same time, the customer buying process was that they got to get into the product. And actually, a lot of our competitors were offering, you know, a POC. And so if we didn't do that POC, we could get eliminated fairly early. 
And also what I realized is that some companies build their products and this whole product led sales to really work and enhance on that first time user experience, right? So if you are like, yeah, it's demo, you get one demo. Someone wants to get in and they want to test drive. Like you better make that first time user experience very easy or you will get eliminated early. Um, I have a lot of passion and opinions around this because I think it is how our, our buyers are evolving. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, it's, it's again, what's interesting when you look at some of these companies going back to that first slide, the Venn diagram, some companies really were built with that in mind and some were not. And that's okay. I've seen companies having as much trouble going from straight self-serve product led to try to go up market into a sales led motion as I've seen companies trying to go from a sales led down to an experiential. So um, you really have to kind of do what's best for your company and how do you really um, embrace what made your company special and what it was and then how do you take those learnings and layer it into kind of going the opposite direction if you will. That's great. Again, a lot of questions. I'm going to continue to compile them and, and bring them in. Please keep them coming. Please keep them coming. Cool. So we talked about leaning on pre-sales demo expertise. We talked about leaning on pre-sales effectiveness and flexibility in front-facing situations. The third one is going to tap into pre-sales being typically the product or technical experts within a sales organization. So buyers really do expect and reward knowledgeable human interactions, more so now than ever, because a human interaction is supposed to be more than what they could do if they were just trying the product on their own. So they expect you to come armed with the right answer to whatever it is that they want to engage you with whenever they want to engage you. But as we saw for product-led sales companies, this can be really, really difficult. These sellers are struggling to answer their customer questions both quickly and accurately. The both there is important. They're struggling keeping up to date with frequent product changes and they're struggling because their team spread out all over the world, right? So that challenge in the top left, combined with knowing that customers will reward people who are fast and accurate and knowledgeable, what does that lead to? Well, if an AE can't have an SE on every single call and they can't default to the old, oh, good question, let me bring my SE on the next conversation. What do they do? I'm sure you guys probably see this a lot in your organizations. I've certainly seen it a ton. They get this question. They're not 100% sure how to answer it. So they real quick private message an engineer or a product manager who's three time zones away and not online. When they don't get an answer in a couple minutes, they go shout in the public Slack channel, you know, like, hey guys, got this question, what do I do? They get five different people with various versions of the truth and they share, you know, a partially wrong answer to the prospect because they feel the pressure being driven by the customer that they need to be fast and accurate, right? So this is the problem that, that companies are facing in this new world. And so what's the opportunity for pre-sales? I'm kind of going back to that survey we, we ran. What was interesting is for the group that we asked, you know, what, what's a challenge for you? And they said, difficulty answering customer questions quickly and accurately. Then we said, what are you doing to overcome this? 47% of them said that they're using product information multiple times per day. That was more than double the second thing, the second type of information they were using, right? So this shows and presents another way that pre-sales folks can add value. Rather than the product expertise living in your head, and you being the one to deliver that directly to the AE, there's my alarm, directly to the AE or directly to the prospect, find ways to disseminate that information in a way that's a bit more scalable. So here's an example, what you see on your screen here. When a customer asks a question, you know, how do we do X, Y, and Z, instead of just saying, here's how you do, go take this to your customer, think about it as there's probably five other AEs who have the exact same question being dictated by five other prospects. You know, what can we do now to make the entire system more efficient by not only answering the question, but documenting that? And so really it's, again, just kind of getting into this, this motion of document the information, actively keep it up to date or transfer it to the person who has the ongoing subject matter expertise, whether it is that product manager or engineer three time zones away, and then look for ways to 
actively push it out to the AEs in context so that they can use it multiple times a day as, as we saw. So when you're doing that, you really are enabling the AEs and the rest of the sales team to self-serve. And this is obviously being driven by this customer expectation that we keep talking about, but it's also being driven by the opportunity in medium that we're seeing more and more. And what I mean by that is, you know, we're all video selling right now because we're in quarantine, but Gartner actually predicts that 75% of all meetings are going to be virtual by 2024. And what that means is that unlike in-person meetings, you do have this window where when someone asks a seller a tough product question, there is a small window there where you could access and use product information if done correctly. And so someone says, how do you do X, Y, Z? And a seller responds, you know, tell me a little bit more. What do you mean by that? Or what are you looking to accomplish? Boom, 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 pulls up the product information and can actually deliver a good, fast, accurate response to the prospect in that moment, purely because of the medium now being virtual instead of face-to-face. Yeah, so, I, man, I really like this section for sure because, you know, one of the things that sticks out in my mind is that there's there's an obvious behavior change that needs to happen here, right? And uh, reps kind of self-serving product info, you know, that might be created or facilitated by pre-sales. Like, you know, how, how do you kind of get through that type of scenario? Um, it sounds like a, a big, big task for us. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I think one is you have to prove that there's a need. Two is then you have to have an operational model that actually works. And then three is you have to prove that it's working, right? So on the need, again, the data is there and, and anybody who's interacting with the customer knows that the need to have fast, accurate answers is, is there, right? So that shouldn't be really hard. The second piece is then the operational model. What is someone looking for when they're looking for information? They need it to be right there, wherever they are, super accessible, as opposed to something they have to go find. Then when they get it, they have to clearly know that it's up to date, kept up to date by the same person who they were trying to ask three times on away previously. Uh, and then the last piece is, you know, proving that it works. So what's interesting, like I said, is that, you know, 40%, 47% of the people said that they're using product information multiple times a day. That's proving to you that, hey, others are doing it. 72% uh, of the people that we asked said that this approach help them spend less time pinging subject matter experts directly. 61% uh, said that their sellers felt more confident. So the data is there. So what I would say is try this out with a few reps, maybe try it out with your best reps or with new reps who haven't done anything, anything at all at your company. Try it out with them, run a survey and then share that with the rest of the team. Here's the problem. Here's one way that we're trying to solve it. And here's proof that it's working. Well, that's perfect. That's great. Um, we are getting some great questions in. I uh, thank you, Yuji, who's who's helping with those questions. Um, I, I, you know, I think from this side, Rob, thanks for the content so far. I think we want to shift into a, a bit of Q and A over the next five to ten minutes. Um, before we do that, you know, I I've, I've been kind of taking some notes throughout this too. Um, I want to recap what I've kind of heard through this, right? And so, in these three sections, right, empowering the AEs, top of the funnel facilitating mid funnel product expert experience and then extending product expertise. How I look at this is like, number one is customers are dictating that they want to see the product sooner, right? Like pre-sales, we can't be on every disco call moving forward. I know some people that are one to eight ratios, one to 10, one to 15. There's no way they can actually do that. So we need to be taking the steps to empower AEs in a variety of ways. Um, number two, you know, we can't wait for product learnings to happen on the second, third, and fourth demo, right? Like we need to figure out ways to like layer in the experiential component of what we do and guide the customer in that portion of the buying process. Again, the buying process versus our sales process and meddling them both together. And then I think what might be the most important for pre-sale people is it's no longer good enough to be like the single most technical expert and have all of that tribal knowledge. Uh, it, it, it's great. It's great for internal branding, but as an organization moving forward, empowering your peers, empowering the teams, especially those that are super connected to product and engineering, connected to sales, like there's just so much more we can do 
And I think there's so much more that has happened in the pre-sales rules and has turned into a bit of an enablement for the selling teams that like that is where our future is in terms of, again, getting a seat at the table, making sure we have more value at an organization. Awesome. So with that being said, we are gonna do one more pull. And while we do that, we are gonna start on a couple Q and A. So what we wanna do on this last poll is ask, you know, which of these three items is gonna be the most difficult for you within your organization? Is it empowering AEs at the top of the funnel? Is it extending the product expertise? Is it facilitating the experience? We'll leave that on and, and see how that goes here for a minute and we'll start on some Q and A. Um, I think the first place uh, to start <laughs> um, is AEs giving demos scares the hell out of me, right? Like, especially for a platform, right? Like for me being at Salesforce, there is a lot of product out there. And I have debated this for years and I'm sure sales leaders have, have disliked me for years because there's so many that I don't want demoing the product um, because I probably wouldn't take a second meeting. And then there's a, there are, there is a chunk of AEs that are phenomenal with the product, right? And very good value sellers. Um, so like what gives, like where's the middle group and where have you seen some success in that? Yeah. Um, this is where, if you think back to kind of the, the first, um, the first example that I showed around the 30 minute discovery demo framework, sometimes just having that can be super, super helpful and super empowering because it then becomes, uh, you break the meeting down into these very manageable chunks. So I don't feel like I have to go, oh my God, I have to show the entire thing in 30 minutes. So it's like five minutes intros and, and personal back and forth. Most AEs are super comfortable there. Five minutes straight discovery with no slides. Most AEs are pretty comfortable there. Maybe it's five minutes like background deck to get a sense of like what the hell it is that we do. Most AEs are comfortable there. Then it's 10 minutes demo and five minutes map out a process. And in that 10 minute demo, here's some additional resources that if you just show one of these three our most core features that get people excited, here's a really simple way to do this one, this one, and this one. So just adding that little bit of structure, I found can be really, really helpful. And again, a good internal branding exercise for, for pre-sales to show that not only am I really awesome at doing this live, but I can then help everybody else be just as effective for these small chunks of, of, of a demo. Yeah, no, that, that's really good feedback. And we got a couple of people who responded and made some comments. Uh, Emily mentioned that they've created like 10 click demos, which provide 10 things to click on and they make sure all their AEs are certified before they ever get out in the field. You know, that's I love that. Yeah, I know. That's, that's pretty good. I like that. 10 click demos. Yeah. Emily, that sounds like uh, that could be the title of your book. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. I love it. Um, actually, I, I, I want to ask a question um, around partnership because this is something that continues to happen. And I know we've, we've talked about it a bit, right? But like, <clears throat> I have really spent a lot of time in my career in terms of building partnership with AEs, sales leaders, um, you know, from frontline all the way up you know, what are some ways that we can continue to arm our AEs to be dangerous? Maybe something that wasn't, wasn't mentioned today. Well, it's interesting. Um, I know you guys had Chris White on last week's conversation. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. When he talked to me about his book early on, the thing that I loved the most was he was coming at it from a very um, empathetic and human perspective. And that's something that I really didn't have an appreciation for when I was, before I had become an AE. I was like, oh, I'm doing most of the selling anyway. I can do everything I can do. Um, and it wasn't until I actually stepped into carrying a bag and realized like, wow, prospecting is really hard. Navigating an organization is really hard. Procurement is really hard. Um, and so I think that that's probably, it's not necessarily a tactic as much as it's a, a, a thought process is to like, pre-sales needs to be empathetic to what it means to be an account executive. And what are the things that they just naturally do really well that maybe we don't do as well and what are the things that we do well that that they don't do as well um so i would i would say that that's something if, if and it took me a really long time to get there uh but once i did i felt that i became a better pre-sales professional and in turn 
we're going through this at Guru right now. We have a, um, our uh, SMB segment has never worked with pre-sales before. Mm -hmm. So we're integrating a brand new SE into uh, the workflow of these AEs who have never worked with them. And I said it to one on a call today. I was like, dude, go listen to this mock demo that you just did with the SE and compare it to the last demo that you did solo and see how much different and better it is for the prospect. Because on one, you have one voice the entire time trying to juggle discovery, next steps, demo. And on this one, the SE is doing an awesome demo. You're hop hopping in with customer stories and proof and asking different questions to get at different things. You're then thinking about what they told you five minutes ago and how you can make the next step in the process more relevant. Game change, right? So I would say that that's the most, uh, most important thing that, that you can do is yeah. think through and be empathetic. Yeah, I like that. I think that's one of the things that I missed early in my career is like not doing that route and not really empowering people the way we probably should have. Uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. So speaking of Chris, because I saw this come through earlier from him. Um, <laughs> Hannah made a funny comment. Um, I'll bring that up later. So would you recommend um, a disco demo script to include, you know, a demo for one main feature or would it be more broad and non-specific? So in the book, I talk about demo buckets and how one feature or one topic could be a bucket. Um, and so I usually like to say in a discovery demo, be prepared to show maybe one bucket, maybe two buckets. And what bucket you decide to show should probably cover two things. One is it's especially in a discovery demo early in the sales process. One is it probably max, maps back to one of the core required capabilities that your solution has that people with the types of problems you solve are looking for. Uh, and two is it's relevant to the conversation. So if someone, if, if the 15 minutes of discovery conversation and back and forth has been about topic A, I'm not gonna jam feature B just because it's our sexiest feature. I'm gonna choose like, um, one of the top five and say, okay, this is the one that's most relevant to helping them solve that. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, just for everyone on the line from a timing perspective, we want to wrap up at least five minutes ahead of time to give you time to go to your next demo or our next presentation. But we've got some good questions, but I want to ask one more, and this is going to be a, a blend of two questions that I think really will make sense is that what are your thoughts and ideas about products that don't work in the standalone mode? They're very, uh, they're used deeply integrated with other larger application stacks and demoing them specifically out of context is dif difficult. And a second question that came up is like, what if their products an API, right? Like there's still no standalone trials. What are your thoughts and suggestions there? Yeah, I'd say then, and speaking specifically about the first conversation, James? Yes. How much can you show the, the outcome that it enables? And so if it's an API solution that enables you to visualize data from one system to another, show what it looks like in the other system. You know, it sounds like you can't visualize your data in this way. If you use the API, this is how it would look. Now let's map out a process where let's say it's another demo, let's say it's a trial, let's say it's a proof of concept. You'll be able to, to figure out the how now that you believe in the, the, the why or, or the vision. So I would say that that's, um, yes, that someone just said, Sasha just said, do the last thing first. Exactly. If, if nothing else, um, show the outcome, because then if they believe in the outcome, you can always back into the how and the nitty gritty. Yep. Love that. Well, I think from a timing perspective, uh, I want to say thanks, Rob. Really appreciate this conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and as we wrap up, just give us about two or three more minutes. You can ask a poll question. Um, let us know how we did today, one to five. We really want to know. This helps us uh, really cater and tailor our, our, our PSC webinars. We also want to know if we're going to see you next week. We have uh, virtual best practices uh, with Paul Pierce. So um, just before we, re we recap, um, do you mind pulling up the slides for me, Rob, and I'm just gonna showcase just one or two things for everybody. So what we did last time um, after our presentation with Chris is we went to the discussion boards 
and we posted a follow-up. And we want to do that again today. Uh, thank you to Chris and everyone who asked questions last week. Rob has graciously offered to do the same this week. So we'll post this topic on the discussion board right after this. Ask your questions. Let's continue the conversation there. Uh, we found it to be really successful, so we're excited about that. And then I want to talk about what's coming over April and May. Uh, we mentioned that you know we're really focusing on webinars. We have weekly webinars between now and the end of April, or excuse me, the end of May, eight weeks in a row. So next week is going to be virtual best practices, demo in the new norm with Paul Pierce. He's a great demo certified training affiliate. Uh, if you haven't been to one of his presentations before, it's going to be awesome. It's going to really help, especially now. It's very timely. And on the 29th, we're really excited for driving better business results through diversity and inclusion. Star-studded panel. Uh, UG is going to be hosting. We have some people who've been in the industry for a long time. We're really, really excited about that. And then into May, I've only highlighted two on this slide, but we're going to be having four. And our first one is No Woman Left Behind. We um, you know, fortunately have met some really senior individuals um, at DocuSign, Salesforce, and this panel is going to be hosted by Hannah. So I'm going to strongly encourage everyone to be at that panel. Doesn't matter if you're male or female. Um, it's a topic just like diversity and inclusion that we all need to be aware of and, and continue to support. Uh, product expertise is temporary, value is forever. How about a title? Uh, Zach Lawrick and Jesse Daly later this month. Additionally, we're going to be having integrating a holistic approach toward becoming a best in class sales engineer. And we'll have, uh, we're finalizing growing and scaling SE teams via hypergrowth. Those will be on the webinar RSVP page uh, within the next day. Lastly, um, I want to go ahead and highlight our blog. Blog content has been great. We have a number of people that are writing. Um, quality, quality articles, two or three per week. If you have interest in writing one off or continual, don't be afraid to reach out. Please let us know or reach out to us via contact us. And if you haven't seen it, we started our newsletter yesterday, a uh, bi-weekly newsletter. We were going to feature some people uh, from the pre-sales collective as well. So with that, I just want to say thank you all again for being here today. Really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate your time. Rob, fantastic job. Great conversation, great discussion. Uh, I need to thank DemoFlow, Larson Stair, and team for the webinar license again. And uh, thank you everyone for coming today and we hope to see you next